When you think of the church, what comes to mind? Maybe the words Sunday, gatherings, hymnals, potlucks. But are these things really what describes the church? What if COVID-19 has called for a radical rediscovery now that the church has left the building? I was in the Dominican Republic this January with a team from Grace visiting our partner church there. We had a neighborhood outreach event one afternoon on an abandoned corner lot in a very poor section of Cancino Adentro. I was sitting in a little group of boys waiting for the program to begin and they were doing boy stuff, wrestling around, playing, dancing the, the floss, you know, and then we, we got into this thing where they were showing me their, their boxing moves. And as I watched them all shadow boxing with each other, my mind started to wander. You know, we'd found out earlier in the week that most of these kids had never been outside this little 10 block radius or so that they lived in. This little neighborhood marked by extreme poverty might be the only part of the world they'll ever know. A lot of their moms were, were standing, kind of gathering around the perimeter, and most of their earthly goods could probably fit in a shopping cart. And I started thinking about, you know, what, what hope do these boys have in this world? What do the next 20 years look like for these young men? What, what is their best shot at leaving their mark, of finding their purpose in life? To be honest, I felt a little despair until I remembered one of the reasons that we were there to support Pastor Silverio and his church just around the corner. I was reminded of the old adage that the local church is the hope of the world, that the darkness of this world can be chased away when even the, the smallest of lights shines into it. And Silverio's church has a shot at, at making sure that those kids are being fed, that they're getting an education, that they're equipped with a, a moral and spiritual compass that'll allow them to navigate the struggles of this life. It, it, it'll introduce them to the saving work of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, who will equip those boys to deal with anything that life throws at them. That little church in that tiny community could make all the difference in the lives of those boys. The church is the hope of the world. It was Jesus' plan A and there was no plan B. And I've been a pastor at Grace Church now for 25 years and I can personally testify that this is true. I know that the church gets a bad rap in, media, in the media these days. But I have to tell you, I've seen countless marriages get healed through the church. I've seen countless families restored through the church. I've seen hope embodied even in the most hopeless situations because of the church. I've seen individuals get healed from addictions and past wounds on a regular basis as a result of the church's work. And just personally for me, back in high school, I was in the youth ministry here at Grace. That's how long I've been hanging around this place. It was a very difficult time in my life. We moved to Erie when I was in ninth grade and it was a tough transition for me. But I had some people from Grace Church who took me under their wing and they set me on the right path and they mentored me and encouraged me and prepared me for life and ministry. And I don't know where I would be without the church. I was baptized at Grace. I've served God with my wife at Grace. I've gotten to watch my kids grow up in the church. I've baptized all three of them at Grace. I don't know where my family or kids would be if it weren't for the impact of the church. And again and again and again, I've seen it. That when people connect up with a great church, when they surround themselves with Christian friends, they increase their chances of entering a fulfilled and purposeful life with God, becoming a better person, a more hopeful, joyful, spiritually charged person. And so a few years ago, we entered our most recent vision initiative called Transform 1-8. It was March 4th of 2018 when we as a church agreed on some initiatives that we would chase together through August of 2021. We called it Transform because we believe God is calling us to make positive change in our own lives and in the world around us, to be a transforming force. And 1-8 because of Acts 1-8, which I'll remind you of in just a moment. But hundreds of the people of Grace Church, ranging in age from 15 to about 85, had a hand in creating this vision. And because of that, I believe that this vision represents the heartbeat of our church. People have committed a lot of money and energy to seeing these dreams come to life. And recently, because of the big pause button of COVID-19, we've had to decide, are we going to continue on the current timeline or delay? And we've decided to continue. And we recognize that the outcomes might not be exactly the same in the end as we had thought, but God has been faithful so far, and we believe that he's gonna continue to lead us where he wants us to go. And so if you've been a part of this vision, I pray that this will be a shot in the arm for you. And if you're new to this idea, I hope that you'll get a glimpse of the heart of our church as you explore it. 
So I would love for you to head over to whoisgrace.com slash transform, where I've posted a more detailed update video about where we stand currently and how you can get involved. But here's a brief synopsis that's gonna set up today's passage. In Acts 1-8, Jesus laid out his strategy to the original disciples for spreading his message of hope to the world. And that strategy worked, by the way, because here we are thousands of years later on the other side of the planet talking about him. And so here was the strategy. Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so a couple years ago, we said, well, let's not reinvent the wheel here. Let's look at these four concentric circles and imagine what they would look like in our context. And so Jesus said, be my witnesses first in Jerusalem. And so we said, well, that's just your home turf. For the disciples, this is where their friends and family and the people closest to them lived. And so with this vision, when we talk about your Jerusalem, we're talking about your relationships. I'm filming today in a neighborhood. And as we go, I want you to imagine your neighborhood, your circle of influence, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers. And the hope is that as you are being transformed by God, that you will also become a transformational force in your personal Jerusalem, your home turf. And so we've rolled out some initiatives that would help you to move your faith from weekly to daily, to provide tools for you to share your story. And so then Jesus said, and, and to reach all of Judea, which was the, the name for their whole region. And so we're calling Judea your site. It's Gerard or Harbor Creek or McCain or whatever region your site is located. And so if God is transforming you, you're going to have a transformational impact on your site. And so we amped up our volunteer engagement at our sites and, and we desire to double the, the, the reach at our sites. To facilitate that, we even build a brand new facility to increase our reach in Harbor Creek. We can't wait to meet there again. Samaria is that area that was geographically cl close, but culturally different. We're calling this our city. We're, we're called to bring transformation to the city. And so we're re-engaging with the Heritage District through Servere. We're also moving forward with plans for the Grace Leadership Institute, where we're going to provide practical and theological training for people in our city. And, and then finally, that last circle is the ends of the earth. It represents our world. And so we have global partners in, in Haiti and the DR and Japan and missionary partners all over the earth. And so, you know, kids like my little circle of boys in the Dominican can have hope for their future. And so today I want to take a closer look at how this played out for those original disciples because it took a strange turn that, that's actually eerily similar to the situation we find ourselves in right now. We're in a series called The Church Has Left the Building and just like Jesus' original strategy, his current strategy involves the church leaving the comfort of our buildings and reaching outside our walls too. Originally, remember he said, start with Jerusalem, with your own people, those who are most like you, and then work your way out to the region and to those who aren't like you at all in Samaria, in fact, your bitter enemies, and then eventually to the ends of the earth. And it sounds straightforward, but it wasn't. In fact, for the first seven chapters of Acts, the early disciples did what we tend to do. They played it safe. They didn't even leave their home turf. They basically turned Jesus' words into, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Jerusalem and Jerusalem and Jerusalem. They never spread the love. Why? Because it's still true that when given a choice, the gravitational pull of the church is always internal. It takes incredible effort and intentionality to go outside our walls. It's safer inside. It's more comfortable inside. We can get fed and nurtured and we have all our needs met inside. We don't have to engage with that big bad world out there. We, we like our holy huddle. And I think the original church had a bit of this holy huddle syndrome. They never left Jerusalem. But listen, if we aren't obedient to Acts 1-8, sometimes God will allow an Acts 8-1. It's easy to remember, you just flip the numbers around. In fact, in light of the timing of COVID-19, I think we're in an Acts 8-1 moment right now. If you're curious as to what I mean, turn over to Acts 8-1 in your Bible or device. And here's what I want you to see today. It's our big idea. Sometimes God scatters his people to grow and strengthen the church. And so I want, I want to take you to this true account so that we can learn some important spiritual lessons from it. So look at verse 1 of Acts chapter 8. It says, And Saul approved of his, that's Stephen's, execution. And so here we see a prime example of 
a chapter break in the Bible, not always coming at the right place. And so th this is a summary here at, uh, of, at the end of chapter 7, which chapter 7 is the story of the first Christian martyr named Stephen. And we get this ominous picture that, that this terrorist named Saul is approving of the execution of Stephen. And, and Stephen's execution set off an avalanche of persecution against the whole church. And, and so in an instant, the church shifted from a gathered movement to a scattered movement. And that sounds like it's a bad thing. But as usual, God takes a bad thing and uses it for incredible good. And God will use his church in both the gathered state and the scattering. And so a sacred scattering was set in motion. And I want you to pay particular attention to where they were scattered. Remember Jesus' words in Acts 1.8, go to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. So now Acts 8.1, it says, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered, there's that word, throughout the regions of, listen, where? Judea and Samaria, sound familiar? except the apostles. Now it says, devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Now, now I want you to see from this text four ways that we are strengthened in our scattering. Here's the first. When the church is scattered, ordinary Christians step up. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you look back at verse one, there's this interesting detail that Luke includes. He says that they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, why do you think he said that? You wanna know what I think? I think he wants us to see that it wasn't the apostles. It wasn't the so-called paid clergy who carried the gospel outside of Jerusalem. It was the rank and file Christians. He wants us to take note that the first time the gospel reached outside of Jerusalem was carried by normal people and not ministry professionals. So when a scattering of the church happens, those who have been changed by Christ, those who have been saved and baptized by Christ must now carry the message of Christ to the world. That's you. And the reason I think this is so profound right now, because I think we're in a similar moment. Just like in Acts 8, in 2020, one event changed the church from a gathered movement to a scattered movement. It's called COVID-19. And guys, let me remind you, this event didn't take God off guard. He's not pacing around heaven, stressed out and frantically trying to figure out what he's gonna do next. He's already written the playbook for this one. When the church is scattered, Ordinary Christians need to step up. And yes, I realize it's different now. We have technology, we have pastors and ministry professionals that can still get the word out digitally and, and all that like I'm doing right now. But I would suggest that now maybe even more than ever, people will be far more impacted by you, by a normal Christian living out his or her faith in real time than a professional pastor preaching on the internet. Ordinary Christians need to step up during times of scattering. And what does that look like? Well, at the beginning of this whole pandemic, we talked about loving your actual neighbors to the right and to the left. Have you thought about how to demonstrate love to them lately? Jesus put a huge emphasis on loving your neighbor or your near dweller. What he didn't talk about is a vague kind of love for humanity or for loving everyone, which overwhelms us. No, Jesus narrowed it right down. Don't worry about loving all of humanity. Just love the person to your right and to your left. And so what might that look like? A homemade pie, walking their dog, watching their kids, mowing their lawn, a random gift card for dinner somewhere, a note of encouragement, a trip to the grocery store for them. It's not rocket science. Just love your neighbor. The most powerful attraction to a person who doesn't believe in God is seeing the kindness of someone who has been transformed by the reality of the gospel. And so when the church is scattered, it's not the time for the pastors or the missionaries to step up. It's time for the ordinary Christians to step up and become the voices of hope of Jesus. So have you stepped up to the plate during this season of scattering? It's time. 
Here's the second way that we're strengthened in our scattering. In scattering, former adversaries can become advocates. Look there in verse 3. Did you know that the Saul mentioned here, who was ravaging the church, was about to become the Apostle Paul, the author of half the New Testament, the greatest missionary in the history of the church. And he was one of the first of many examples in history where a fierce enemy of God had his heart radically changed by the love of Christ. My wife Kim was praying for one of her friends for many years. Her friend was one of those people who it, who it seemed like she was just too far gone. She had gone too deep down the path of sin to have any hope. All that was left to do was pray, and so Kim faithfully prayed. And whenever we had one of those moments in our services where we said, you know, write down the name of someone who's close to you but far from God, she would write down this woman's name, knowing deep down that this, this one was a huge long shot. But she prayed, and she reached out, she had faith conversations when they presented themselves, and wouldn't you know it, something out of left field came into this woman's life, and suddenly she was open to considering Jesus. And oh, what a transformation. I had the honor of baptizing her a couple years ago, and she's on fire in her faith. Guys, God still does this work. Adversaries can be changed into advocates, and we need to live in this hope again. Fearsome enemies can become precious friends. Critics can become companions. And these days, it's pretty easy to believe that, that it can go the other way. We see it all the time where someone who used to be a friend becomes a betrayer like Judas. Someone you loved blocks or cancels you from their lives. That's the way of the world. But there's another way. It's the way of Jesus, and we need to remember that it's still possible through the power of God's Spirit that a deadly persecutor can also become a great ally and partner in the cause of Christ. It still happens. And what was it that ultimately changed Saul? Well, obviously, he had a divine encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. But I often wonder how much was his heart softened as he watched the faithfulness of those ordinary scattered Christians, the people he was dragging out of their homes who were willing to give it all for the cause of Jesus, he saw their love, he saw their faithfulness, he saw their courage. Guys, look at your adversaries with the eyes of faith, that someday by the power of God that they could experience a turnaround as amazing as Saul's. All right, so we're strengthened because in scattering, ordinary Christians step up and former adversaries can become advocates. Here's the third way. Scattering allows us to reach beyond our comfortable boundaries. This sacred scattering forced Christians to reach out to people that they otherwise wouldn't have. Verse 5 says specifically, Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now, do you remember Samaria from Jesus' strategy? Yeah, but it didn't stop there. The, the scattering not only sent the church to Judea and Samaria, but let's look at Acts eleven nineteen. 19. It says, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, where we find out that these Christians started speaking to the Greeks about Jesus. In other words, the scattering not only took Christians to Judea and Samaria, but also beyond to the Gentiles, the ends of the earth. It was the scattering of the church that allowed Jesus' original vision to be realized. It was their scattering that pushed them beyond their comfortable boundaries. Now we have to be very mindful that when the church exists in comfort and ease and affluence and prosperity and safety, that it often causes tremendous laziness in the church. And listen, gathering is good and worship and preaching is good and fellowship is really good. But we're not just a community like, you know, us four and no more. We're on mission. And when we're scattered, we have to ask the question, where is God taking us that we wouldn't normally go? Where is he pressing us beyond our comfortable boundaries? And I think of the opportunity right now for the church to step into the conversation about race in our country. Yes, it's uncomfortable. Yes, for a long time, white and black churches have just retreated to their corners. Yes, it's more comfortable and safer when we don't have to deal with the issue of race when it comes to our worship. But is this moment of scattering the perfect chance to wade into these waters? Philip did. He went to the Samaritans. One of the curses you see of having different races and cultures is that it creates an, an us and them mentality. There's us you know, and we're good. We're normal. We, we do the stuff the way it's supposed to be done. And then there's them those people. And we look down at those people. 
and we make up stories in our heads about those people. What kind of evil thoughts must motivate them? What kind of substandard allegiances compel them to do whatever it is they do? And this feeling of superiority can take over. And it's so easy and so dysfunctional how quickly we, we move from, I disagree with them, to all of the thems are evil. All Republicans are evil. All Democrats are evil. All white people are evil. All black people are evil. Not we disagree with each other and we have a lot of stuff to work out, but you are evil. And when we can do that, there's no chance for, no need for love or reconciliation. And so for generation after generation, this was the relationship between the Jews and Samaritans. There was this unspeakable racial and ethnic animosity between these two groups of people that stretched back over a thousand years. You think our divides are deep. It was standard operating procedure for the Jewish people when they were traveling to add a full day to their trip just to go around and be sure that they never stepped foot on Samaritan soil. They hated each other so much. And so when you read matter-of-factly that Philip went down to the city of Samaria, believe me, it wasn't matter-of-fact. The scattering allowed him to go beyond his comfort zone. And notice that the Samaritans there, it says in verse 6, they paid attention to this Jewish dude, Philip, because they both, listen, they heard him and they saw what he did. It wasn't just words, it was his actions that embodied the gospel message. It was like Jesus, who didn't just preach to the crowds, he fed the crowds. He didn't just talk about sin, he ate with sinners. He embodied the blessing of God across all dividing lines, and so must we. We're not the final destination, you see, of God's blessings, but we're only a pass-through. So what would it look like for you to be a blessing to the people beyond your comfortable boundaries? I picture Jesus grabbing his church by the shoulders right now and shaking us and saying, yes, I know you're scattered right now, but look around. I told you that you could have my eyes and my heart. Please look. I want you to see what I see. These are all of my children. Stop focusing on yourself and the people who are just like you. This world is broken. People that I died to redeem are wandering. They're lost, they're angry, they're struggling. They feel abandoned and betrayed and alone. And I have poured out blessing after blessing on you, but it wasn't supposed to end with you. So look outside your comfortable boundaries. Do you see anyone who could use some of the blessings of God in their life? Okay, good. Now don't just say stuff. Show them. What would it look like for you to be a source of blessing to the people in your life, to your family, to the people in your neighborhood? Because maybe people will start to listen to our words if they see our deeds and if they see us loving and if they see us meeting needs and if they see us caring about our community, then maybe they'll start to listen to our words. But it doesn't work the other way around. So finally, we're strengthened in our scattering a fourth way because a scattered church brings healing and joy to the city. Look at verse eight, after the scattered church got into Samaria, when the people there started to experience the love and blessing of God, verse 8 says, and so there was much joy in that city. Let me ask a question. In the last four months since the church has been scattered, has there been much joy in our city as a result? I think in many ways there has. We've seen grace people mobilized all over our community to bring encouragement and prayer and hope to frontline workers and medical staff and police and firefighters and retirement home workers and social workers. Right now there's an effort to provide care packages for every family in the Heritage District neighborhood through Serviri. And the church must continue to lean in because notice, there was joy because there was healing. Church, we are bringers of a new kingdom. And we must never run away from the brokenness in our world. We must run toward it because we know the source of healing. We must not run away from injustice. We must run toward it because we know the source of true justice. We must not become weary because the kingdom of heaven is in the balance. And so they brought joy everywhere they went. There's an incredible passage in the Old Testament in Jeremiah 29. It says the Jews were scattered away from their homeland. They were scattered too. They were sent off to exile in a big pagan city called Babylon. And then God tells them counterintuitively to seek the joy of the city. He tells these Jews, I want you to seek the peace and the prosperity and the shalom of Babylon. This enemy city, pray for it. And then he says this, for if it prospers, 
you will prosper. In other words, your community will prosper if you pour yourself out in deeds of service and seek the prosperity and the peace of the city where you are. And I believe he's saying to us the same thing he said to them. Pour yourself out for the good of the region, for the good of the city and the world to which I've sent you. And as it prospers, you will prosper. I just want to say that I'm proud of our church. I'm proud to be your pastor. Again and again, grace has stepped up to challenges and sought to be a light in our dark world. You've sought to share hope with your friends and neighbors. You've sacrificed to give God's love to our city. And I want to remind us, now is not the time to, to shrink back. Now is not the time to get safe and comfortable. It's going to take a renewed faith and a renewed boldness to step up in a time like this. It seems like hope is lost, but we have the power of the gospel. Fifteen years or so ago, I visited a friend in Washington, D.C., who had become a senior staffer for the Speaker of the House at the time. My friend took me to the Capitol building, and we squeezed into a little tiny elevator and ascended to this impressive office suite occupied by the Speaker of the House and his staff. And he was standing right there when we got to the top. It was surreal. And after sharing a few anecdotes and laughs, he took me out onto the terrace of his office. It's supposed to be one of the best views in Washington, D.C., overlooking the mall all the way to the Washington Monument. And I kid you not, it was palpable. I could actually feel deep down in my bones the weight of power as I stood in that spot. I realized that from this office, laws and nations are created and destroyed. And the course of human history is literally changed day by day. And later that night, as I was reflecting on my experience, I had this moment of realization that, that even though I could feel the political power of that office in my bones, I was reminded that I carry in me, and you carry in you, an even greater power. That even though there was the power of laws and legislation and even military might, they don't have the power to change a human heart. The power of nations can't come close to the power of Jesus Christ. His power is the only thing that can change those four circles, my relationships, my sights, our city, and our world. And yes, I realize that this transformed vision probably isn't going to end the way we, we exactly like we expected it. Because, well, the, the church has left the building. We've been scattered for a season. But as you saw today, God can still strengthen us in our scattering. And there will be a huge and lasting impact in our church and our region and our whole world because of the efforts of this initiative. Again, I'd love for you to check it out and even get involved in making it happen if you're able. I want to end with this. Remember how this whole story began with the martyrdom of Stephen and with Saul looking on. There's a gospel pattern here that we have to notice. Stephen's death led to more and more life. Saul sought the destruction of the church and what did it lead to? It led to the expansion of the church. Saul sought to, to shut it down by scattering, but scattering actually led to strengthening. He tried to kill it and it only led to more life. If you try to put the church to death, it leads to resurrection. Why? Because it's the way of Jesus. Death leads to life. Sometimes something needs to die so something else can live. And happens to us in little ways too. If you give your finances with radical generosity for the needs of others, there's a kind of death in that. You're dying to all kinds of stuff that you could have afforded otherwise. All kinds of fun things that you could have done. But that little death will lead to new life in someone else. What if you decide to stick your neck out and say, I want to identify an eerie PA as a Christian. I don't mean to be ob obnoxious about it. I just mean to be willing to let people know that you possess hope in Jesus. There'll be some small deaths that come with that. Some people will walk away from you. Some people might avoid you. You might miss out on a job. You might get passed over for a promotion. You're experiencing a death of some kind. But as you open up to other people about your faith, that death will lead to life for others. It will lead to resurrection. That's the pattern of the gospel. To give of yourself so that others might have life. Grace, folks, if you want to do this, as we move toward the conclusion of this vision, please head over to whoisgrace.com transform. Recommit yourself to what we're doing. And if you're new to grace, we would absolutely love for you to check it out as well. There are some big plans there and God's in it. I love you guys. We'll see you soon.